Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope you're all having a wonderful day. Before I get started, I want to address a serious, serious subject that affects my heart in a, in a terrible, terrible way. Um, for those of you who don't know, because you live in different parts of the world, or even for those of you who live in Canada who don't know, but uh, recently it's been discovered that uh, over 700 Indigenous children have been found in unmarked graves from uh, what is known as a residential school. Um, residential schools were all throughout Canada, and Indigenous children were forced to go to these schools. The point was they were trying to have their heritage stripped from them. Um, this has been going on a long time, just even up until the, the 90s, I believe was the last, when the last school was closed. I may, may not be exactly right on that. But anyways, I just wanted to reach out because I know that I'm blessed to have uh, Indigenous followers. And I just want you to know that I'm so sorry. Okay, guys, uh, so I guess I'm just going to start chapter 27. Uh, it was still dark out at 6 a.m. when the alarm went off. I've been an early riser for months, but there was just something about that alarm ringing in my ear that made me want to sleep longer. But it was Monday, and Lisa and I had to get the kids up for school. Plus, Scott and Kathy would be here soon for their morning coffee. Our kitchen was the in place to be in the morning. It was always bustling with noise and action. Breakfast was being cooked and eaten, lunches being made, dogs whining and crying to go out, dogs whining and crying to come in, and the little radio in the corner playing quietly. Do you guys want to ride to school this morning, Scott asked, Brianna and Jenny. No, answered Bree. We'll take the bus. Thanks anyways, said Jenny. Yeah, thanks anyways, repeated Bree. Well then, you better get going, said Lisa. The bus will be here soon. The kids jumped up and went to the laundry room for their coats and boots. Minutes later, they put their lunches into their backpacks, kissed us all goodbye, and headed out the front door. I drained the pot and put on a fresh one. We always drank two pots before Kathy and Scott took off to their jobs. Where's Magoo? Still sleeping? asked Scott. Yeah, but I'm going to go and wake her up. We have mom and tots today, and I have to grab the donuts on the way, said Lisa as she stood up to go and wake up Mandy. I heard Lisa call up the stairs for Mandy, which I thought was strange because we had tucked her into her own bed the night before. But maybe she went up to sleep with her sisters. I just wasn't aware of it. Then I heard Lisa running up the stairs. By now, Scott, Kathy, and I were eyeing each other, sipping our coffees. When Lisa screamed Brad, I knew in my heart she couldn't find Mandy. The three of us jumped up, and I ran to meet Lisa, and Scott and Kathy ran to the living room. We searched the house and garage, and even though we were pretty sure she was taken from her bedroom, her screen was laying on the ground. This wasn't the first time we found her screen laying on the ground outside her window. This was, however, the first time she wasn't there where she was supposed to be. Whoever took her had the sense to shut her bedroom window so we wouldn't be alerted by the cold air coming in. We called the sheriff and all the neighbors we knew. Sheriff Martin and a deputy were the first to arrive. We saw them walking up the driveway. Every few steps, they would stop and look at something on the laneway. I ran out to meet them. As I got close, the sheriff held up a hand and said, Don't come any closer, son. We have some fresh tire tracks here, and we need to preserve them. Then, to his deputy, he said, Go back to the car and radio the station to get a hold of the bureau. We have a possible kidnapping. My mouth dropped open and tears sprang to my eyes. I knew she hadn't left on her own, but to hear the words kidnapping scared me to death. Go back in the house, son. I'm going to take a look around. 
Then I'll be in to talk to you, he said very kindly, which surprised me. It wasn't like Sheriff Martin and I were on good terms. After explaining to everyone what the sheriff said, Lisa broke down and Kathy was comforting her. Scott was pacing the hall, and I stood inside the living room, feeling overwhelmed and lost. When I remembered the card that Detective John Lewis gave me earlier in the year, when the old lady went missing, I ran to the kitchen phone and dialed his cell. He answered on the first ring. When I told him who it was, he said he just got the call from his supervisor and was heading to the airport in 20 minutes. Then, in a softer, calmer voice, he said, Brad, we'll find her. You got my word. We did as the sheriff asked and waited for him to come in and talk to us. It seemed to take forever. We felt like we needed to remind him that he needed to talk to us still. So we went and stood outside in the cold. After what seemed like an hour, he started in our direction. Every few feet or so, he would stop and look around on the fresh layer of snow. I got the odd sense that he was doing it out of spite. When he finally made it to the porch, all he had to say was that they suspected she was taken in the early hours of the morning, and they were waiting for some special lab unit to come and check the tire imprints in the snow on the driveway. From that, we could very well get the make and model number of the car that took her. Then he turned to walk away. That was it? Now is not the time to blow us off because of your personal feelings for me, I told him. You want us to go sit and do nothing? But I can't do that, Sheriff Martin. I'm going to go search the back of the property, I added. Mr. Monero, I suggest you calm yourself down right now. I'm doing my best to find your daughter, and you're copping an attitude with me. You're not doing anything but standing around, I yelled. You haven't even asked us a question yet to see what we possibly know. You won't even let us go and look for her, I said a second time. Did you even notice her screen is laying on the ground by her window? Are you aware that we have had a problem with Riley and Irene Miller? Look, I've already told you, go in your house and stay there. If you try to leave, I will have to arrest you for tampering with an investigation. And then he walked away. We went back in and cried in each other's arms. We felt more helpless than we have ever felt in our lives. We had to trust this lunatic was going to find our daughter, and that didn't feel too good at all. Lisa sat down, and I planted a fist in the living room wall. Lisa, I'm going to go search the back, I said. I can't just sit here and do nothing. Brad, I understand exactly how you feel, but I don't doubt for one minute that that sheriff won't arrest you, and I couldn't handle that right now. I need you here with me, she cried. I nodded, and I pulled her close. I rested my chin on the top of her head and thought about why someone would want to take our baby. Then a sick feeling consumed me. I remembered when the baby was taken out of the car seat by a monster man to quote the grandmother of the baby. I kept this memory to myself. Lisa was at her breaking point with fear and anxiety, and I refused to give her even one more thing to worry about. I went into Mandy's room to see if maybe I had missed something. I ended up sitting on the side of the bed, hugging her pillow to me as if it were her. I could smell her baby smell, and before you knew it, I was sobbing. I realized I didn't just feel helpless. I was helpless. Just knowing that we weren't allowed to do anything or go anywhere made this day even harder. A deputy came to inform us that the tracks they thought belonged to the kidnapper were indeed our neighbor's tracks. The neighbor apparently forgot his coffee when he left to go to work, so he turned around in our driveway and went back home to get it. Our neighbor, whom I had not yet met, stopped in to talk to the sheriff on his way home from work to find out what was going on. When Sheriff Martin informed him of his theory that the tracks belonged to a kidnapper, the neighbor brought it to the sheriff's attention that he had turned around in our driveway that morning so the sheriff looked at the treads on the neighbor's tires 
and realized his mistake. It took five hours for the sheriff's department to figure out that the tracks were actually from our neighbor. Actually, the sheriff didn't even realize anything. The neighbor made him aware of it. Five hours were wasted waiting for them to realize their mistake. I was furious. The deputy who informed us of the screw-up also informed us that there was a dangerous storm heading in our direction, which was why a search was put on hold till possibly the morning, if the storm even let up by then. He said that they had helicopters waiting to go up and that the neighbors had been on their phones all day arranging a search party to go out as soon as they got the all clear. He also mentioned that people were dropping by all day to give their support and offering to help in any way. I asked him why we weren't told any of this sooner. He just looked at his shoes and said the sheriff was supposed to tell us himself, but at the last minute he sent the deputy instead. I shook my head with disgust. When are you guys clearing out then, I asked. I think pretty soon. There really isn't anything more that we can do till we get out and search for her, he answered. Then he put his hand on my shoulder and squeezed. Try to get some rest if you can, Mr. Monero, he said, then turned and walked away. Scott called me into Mandy's room after the deputy left. He was standing next to the window. He pointed to the snow-covered ground and asked, Do you see anything unusual? I squinted my eyes and I tried to see if anything jumped out at me. And when it didn't, I looked at him and said, What are you seeing, Scott? There, he said, pointing to a giant footprint in the snow. Once he pointed it out to me, I could see it. Bonnie and Clyde had been back and forth over the area, so the footprint was blended in. Then he pointed to another one, but the opposite foot five feet in front of the first, and then a third one, again roughly five feet in front of the last one. The three prints led into the woods. All of the prints were of bare feet, big bare feet. Oh my God, Scott, they were right. I said, who was right? Scott and I turned to see who was asking the question and were relieved to see Detective John Lewis was standing in the doorway. Ah, John, I'm glad you made it, I said. So how's it going so far? John asked. Oh, you didn't hear how Martin wasted a whole day, I spat. Yeah, I heard, he said, shaking his head. Have you heard anything else official, I asked, not completely trusting what the deputy told me. No, I came here from the airport. Haven't even spoken to the sheriff yet. The deputy who picked me up said the weather is hampering the efforts to put together a search party. Said none of the helicopter pilots will go up till morning unless the weather clears. Yeah, well, they have wasted a whole day. We could have been out there on four wheelers, but they wouldn't let us leave. Martin threatened to arrest me again. I know it's frustrating, but from what I understand, they really thought they caught a break in the tire tracks. Then, when that fell through, the weather started to turn for the worse, said John. Which is more reason for us to be out there looking for her, Scott said, adding his opinion. Come and eat, Lisa called. We all met at the kitchen table. In the center was a big platter of grilled cheese sandwiches, which was far more than I expected from Lisa. She was besides herself with worry and fear. None of us were hungry, but I guess it kept her busy. Lisa put a sandwich on two plates and passed them to Brienne and Jenny. Why don't you guys go and eat in the living room tonight, Lisa suggested, so us adults can talk. Both girls just nodded and walked away slowly. They were terrified when they got off the bus after school and saw all the police cruisers parked in the laneway. Both girls cried when Lisa and I explained the chain of events after they left for school. Just as we were sitting down, there was a quick rap on the door, and Sheriff Martin and his deputies walked in. Folks, have got some news finally. I apologize for the delays that we've had this afternoon. As you know, there's a bad storm on its way, and it was scheduled to hit much earlier today, which is why we have had to hold off the search. But you got my word, we will be here early, 
and we can get the search starting first thing in the morning. And with that, he turned and he walked back out the front door. Lisa ran after them and asked the sheriff if, if he'd even gone around to Mandy's bedroom window to see if he could find any evidence, reminding him that the screen was laying on the ground this morning. He answered her by holding up a hand and continuing to walk away. I hate that man, she said through clenched teeth as she shut the door. I was surprised he lasted this long into the evening, to be honest. We had planned to do our own search as soon as the cops all cleared out. I couldn't leave my baby out there all night if I could help it, especially now that I suspected it was one of those creatures that took her. I wanted to talk to Lisa, Scott, and Kathy about the footprints Scott found and get their opinion on telling John everything. At the table, John asked what I meant earlier when I said, Scott, they were right. I hesitated only a moment before diving in and telling him everything. We all took turns adding different experiences we'd had over the last 10 months. When we were nearing the end, I went on to explain what my parents had told us when they were here for their visit. John had no expression on his face whatsoever, so I felt like he was doubting us. I told Scott to go and get the strongest flashlight he could find because it was too dark to even see with the perimeter lights on. When Scott got back with the flashlight, I told John to come outside with us. I told Lisa and Kathy to come too. I knew that they would want to see this as well. But first I made a trip to the bedroom and grabbed a couple handguns and a couple of shotguns. I handed the handguns to the girls and shotguns to Scott. I noticed John had raised an eyebrow. All I said was, you'll understand in a minute. When we got around to the side of the house, Scott shined a flashlight in the vicinity of where we first saw the footprints. But it wasn't there. We searched for at least ten minutes while Lisa, Kathy, and John waited patiently, just looking at us. Finally, Lisa said, "Hun, what are you looking for? There were three huge footprints, Lisa, I answered, and they were bare footprints. You could see them from Mandy's bedroom window, and that's what we were looking at, John, when you came in earlier. My parents were right. Those footprints were Bigfoot, and I think they took Mandy. Oh, my God, I just realized something else, I said, sounding like a raving lunatic. Mandy's been talking to an invisible friend that she named Sully, after the cartoon character from her movie, Monsters Incorporated, I said to John. I'm familiar with that movie, he said. It all makes sense to me now. Sully is a giant hairy creature in the movie. That's why she's calling her friend Sully, because he's a giant hairy creature, like Sully in the movie. Yeah, except Sully from the movie is blue, said Scott. I don't think that would be an issue for a four-year-old, I said, as the realization was finally making an impact on my brain. So what happened to the footprints, asked John. I don't know. They were here like, what, half an hour ago, I asked Scott. He nodded, still searching the area for some clue to stand out. Then he said, it had to be one of the cops. Look at all the footprints here, he said, making a swooping motion with his hand. They all look like cowboy boots. We all said it at the same time, Sheriff Martin. Why would Martin purposely destroy evidence, Kathy asked, looking at John for the answer. We don't know he did destroy it on purpose, he answered. John, are you nuts? Look. The first print was about here, right? I said, pointing to, to the first group of cowboy boot prints. Then he walked over to where the next print was and marched all over it. Then to the last one. Then he walked back to the front yard. John, I'm not a cop, and I could clearly see what he did. So you're saying that he did this in the last half an hour or so? John asked. Yes, he did, said Lisa. I'm to blame because I was the one who told him to check out Mandy's window screen lying on the ground. Well, where is the screen? asked Kathy. 
After looking around for it, we could only assume the Sheriff Martin took it with him for whatever reason. Lisa started to cry. I shouldn't have said anything. It's all my fault. I went over and hugged her and let her sob. The other three, I noticed, walked out into the backyard. We're going to get her back, I said. Lisa, I promise we'll get her back. And that, my friend, is the end of Chapter 27. And yes, my throat has blown out again, but it's my own fault. I was so excited earlier. My son got his dream job, so I did a couple of woohoos and blew out the throat. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to rest my throat for a little while. If I can manage to settle it down a little bit, I'll do chapter 28. But if not, then you'll have to wait till tomorrow. Okay, guys, you know I love you, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Bye for now.